Hey, aloha, and welcome to another exciting episode of Stan Energy Man, Stan Osserman, coming to you live from the windward side of Oahu, Kailua, Hawaii, and um, glad to be with you. Today's going to be a, a little bit of a different show. It's going to take off from last week's show where we talked about energy and power and the relationship and the differences between energy and power. But I'm going to kind of focus on the power side and even get into uh, a little bit of what we might be called non-traditional power or power other than directly related to energy and and even talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned that I hope we've learned from the cur current pandemic. So last week when we talked about energy and power, I said that um, energy was basically um, the uh, the source of um, motivation or mechanics to get things moving. So energy comes in many, many forms. You can have light energy, um, you can have sound waves, you can have um, nuclear energy, you can have um, heat, you can have uh, motion, you can have gravity, you know, pulling a, a heavy rock down a hill, potential energy. You have kinetic energy for two things banging into each other. You have a lot of energy, but the main thing that you have to understand about energy is the first law of thermodynamics, which states that energy can neither be created or destroyed. It just changes form. So when people think about energy and whether we could actually run out of energy, um, I can safely tell you that if we ever run out of energy, um, we don't have to worry about it because none of us will be here. The entire universe from the atomic level up to the solar system level requires energy to keep it functioning. And so when you think about energy, uh, and I said this last week, if you think about it at the atomic level, the example I've been, I've been taught is that if you had an atom, the protons and neutrons would be like a basketball sitting on the 50 yard line of a state football stadium and that the electrons would be little tiny mosquitoes whizzing around in the upper bleacher section. So in essence, most atoms are empty of, of actual material other than these particles that are either stationary in the center of the atom, protons and neutrons, or they're um, the electrons whizzing around the outside. And then when you get to explaining what energy does for you and how you how you can change forms from heat energy to electric energy or light energy to electric energy or um, heat energy to mechanical energy and things like that, that's where the term power comes in. When you actually have energy doing work, some kind of work, that's called power. So you have a gasoline engine running off of gasoline fuel and it's turning the pistons and a crankshaft and giving you torque and uh, power at your wheels for your vehicle and that's power if you have a nuclear power plant that's heat superheating water into steam and running it across turbines <clears throat> excuse me that's another kind of energy <clears throat> so uh, that's another kind of power then you can have solar panels that take light energy and turn it into electricity, DC electricity. And then you can take the DC electricity and run it through an inverter and get AC electricity. So that energy doesn't, doesn't get lost. It just changes from one thing to another and gives us the ability to do work so that we as people aren't using our own calories and our own muscles to do the work, but we're using other things to help us get work done without expending our own personal energy. And I mean, you can even look at the body. The human body takes in food and oxygen and nutrients and stuff, and we can move our muscles, our heart pumps, our brain works. And it's all based on the same kind of energy cycles that, that provide us fossil fuels and things like that. Fossil fuels are basically um, solar energy that's been captured in part of this cycle of plants and and when the plant dies and starts to decay underground under pressure and things like that it turns into either coal or oil or natural gas uh, methane natural gas is um, ch4 so it's 
It's a, it's a four hydrogen atoms and one carbon atom, but it basically comes from plants. So the term fossil fuel is a little bit of a misnomer because it's really not dead dinosaurs, it's mostly dead plants and decaying plants. So anyway, when it comes to power though, there's, I, I say two kinds of power. There's there's a kind of physical power that we talk about with energy. <clears throat> and then there's a non-traditional power, but it's just as real a power. It's, it's power that um, you're all aware of. And, and as I start to mention the different examples, you'll be able to appreciate it. Um, you have military power. I mean, uh, the military might of a country is certainly a power. In fact, the actual ordinance that, that military people um, use in combat to provide kinetic um, you know, impact and, and bombs and things like that, that's basically kinetic energy. It's, it's, it's power. Uh, using energy and and um, kinetic forces to deliver, you know, a coercive force on somebody else's army or military. So you have military power, but that's not the only kind of power. I mean, think about the other end of the spectrum. You have the power of love. You know, the power of love and the power of faith and the power that you have um, in in religions and and in meditation and things. That has a whole nother power to it on the other end of the spectrum that is a lot harder to get your head around, um, but it's just as powerful. Those faith and things like that have moved mountains and, and done tremendous things. You have economic power. You have companies that, um, that uh, make lots of money and do great work and great philanthropists that take money and, and uh, do powerful things with it for society. Uh, turn it into medications or feeding people that otherwise couldn't afford it. You have um, political power. You have the power of politicians to uh, make laws and send those military people to war and, and establish national foreign policy and things like that and trade agreements. So that, that's all in the realm of politics. But when you think about it, um, there's one more power that kind of has come into play in my mind, especially recently, but in reality, I'm, I'm 66 years old and I've been around to see a lot of things in this world. And, and in, in my mind, this last power that I had on my list is, is one that really has played a huge role. And um, I guess the best way I could describe it is the old quote, I believe it's from Shakespeare, but the pen is mightier than the sword. And uh, in today's world, it's basically communications as a powerful tool. Information and communications is hand in glove the, between the two of them, probably one of the most influential powers that we see floating around today. So lessons learned during this COVID-19 pandemic that I think are important for us to take away, <clears throat> especially in that non-traditional power category, are the fact that we've kind of experienced, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, some things that have opened our eyes, that have, have given us the personal energy and the personal power to recognize things that maybe we just kind of been lulled into accepting or or lulled into um, following, or maybe just never really thought about it because we're so busy with our cell phones and our computers and our games and, and our movies and our TV shows and things like that. And, and so the, the two things that, that I really think shine for me in terms of this pandemic and power are number one, <clears throat> the fact that our American experiment in the Democratic Republic uh, has insidiously um, been degraded over time. And if you try and explain the popularity of a Bernie Sanders and the socialist movement and stuff, you can probably say it's because a lot of people feel disenfranchised from the government. They feel like they're wasting their vote. It doesn't matter who you vote for because nothing ever changes. Um, voter uh, apathy is is higher than it's ever been up until probably the 2016 election. Um, and people are just tired of wasting their time voting for people 
and those people go to Congress and or to the White House or to the governor's office <clears throat> in the state legislature and things just never change except maybe get worse and, and very few things get fixed and a lot of things stay broken and there's there's crisis seemingly going on all the time and always nothing but problems. So in my mind, what I've seen over my lifetime of, of you know six decades is that in our federal government and in our state government, I've seen a lot of the power of the legislative branch migrate to the executive branch in a couple ways. Um, the legislature is supposed to draft the laws and, and it has the representatives of the people from the, the district level, kind of like the community level in the house side, and then from the state level or the, the broader uh, population on the Senate side that are supposed to take um, and make legislation that helps guide our country and keeps us in a balanced budget situation and things like that and takes care of those big administrative things. But over the years, I've seen a lot of that pro uh, power and a lot of that responsibility handed to the executive branch, to the governors and to the president. And a lot of it's, I think, because a lot of the legislative branches have just said, well, well, we have too much at risk. You know, if we if we don't do this or that, you know, we, we might not get elected. So we'd rather just push that responsibility to the president or the governor and tell them to do it. And then we don't have to risk putting our reputations on the line and, and risk not getting elected, um, especially on the House side, where every two years you're up for reelection. So we, what we see is we see a lot of the government shifting from the legislative power side back to the executive side. On the executive side is where all the people work. You know, not a whole lot of people work directly for legislators. I mean, they have their staff and things, but the majority of civil service lines up under the executive branch, under the governor, under, under the president. And when that happens, and you develop a civil service, and oh, by the way, I have 24 years of federal civil service, six years of state civil service, and just shy of two years of county civil service. So I, I'm pretty experienced on civil service period and civil service, civil um, or um, uh, public workers unions and things, and have been a supervisor too. So I've had to deal with the union issues and also deal with the legislative folks and, and the congressional delegations for our state. Um, and the governor, um, work with the governor quite a bit. So when it comes to watching that power shift, I'm a little bit nervous because in the civil service, you, we, what we've got over the years is we have a larger and larger group of people who are not elected, who are appointed by elected officials, who get into positions, many of whom, if they're rank and file, they're not, they're not in SES level federal positions or senior state positions like department heads. They basically have a job for 25, 30 years. And it's almost impossible to fire a rank and file civil service person, especially if they're in a union, it's, it's really difficult. So what we've got is we've got a big chunk of our government that is not elected. And if you don't like the policies and stuff that they're pushing and you don't reelect the president or whatever, nothing changes. The next president comes in unless he spends all of his energy trying to change the stuff to, to the way it should be and get rid of some of the people that aren't carrying out his policies, what you get is a lot of wasted time. Does this sound familiar to what we see going on right now? Uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious that we have a president that's frustrated by a bunch of people that he never changed out because he didn't have the bench to pick from and he's been fighting for three years. But the other piece that comes with that shift of power to the executive branch is the fact that those executive branch departments, Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, um, Department of Defense, Department of uh, Land and Natural Resources or uh, 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 education or whatever, they start to develop the EPA, they start to develop their own regulations. And they start actually putting those regulations into play with penalties. So in essence, they're actually writing laws 
that aren't laws, they're just regulations, but they have the force of law. And then the courts, because of the way they were all structured, the courts will tend to back up the government and those rules as if they were laws. So our whole government system has shifted quite a bit. And that's really one of the key things that has really um, gotten my attention over, over my generation, my, my lifetime. I've just kind of seen this insidious change in government to where back when I was you know, a teenager or younger, the government had a significant role to play, but it didn't control your life. I mean, there, you could still have a voice. You could still petition your congressman or whatever, and they would actually listen to you. But that doesn't seem to happen as much nowadays. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and then about the second part of non-traditional power that's really gotten my attention lately after we take a quick break. Aloha, I'm Krista Stadler, the host of Nonprofits Mean Business 2 on Think Tech Hawaii. Nonprofits Mean Business 2 investigates the operational challenges and costs related to managing nonprofit organizations while encouraging our viewers to find a nonprofit organization that you're passionate about in our community. We are streamed live on Think Tech Hawaii bi-weekly at 12 p.m. on Thursdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo. Welcome back to Stan Energy Man and uh, Stan Osterman here. And we're talking about a kind of a transition from traditional energy and power into the non-traditional pieces of power that I've experienced over my life that are basically impacting our government and our foundational pieces of our constitution. You know, the constitution was designed so that unlike any other government that's ever existed on the face of the earth, that the power to run the country rested in the hands of the citizens. The, the term of, by, and government of, by, and for the people is enshrined in what we call our basic tenets um, of, our, of our government, of our constitution. And our constitution gives us a framework of how the Congress is set up and relates to the president and how the military is set up and fits in the whole picture and how the states relate to the federal government. And then the first 10 amendments of the constitution called the Bill of Rights gives us things like, you know, our ability to speak freely, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, um, freedom to assemble, lawfully assemble and, and petition the government with grievances. Um, the right to keep and bear arms, which I, I'd like to point out as a personal note, the right to keep and bear arms is the only um, Bill of Rights uh, amendment that allows us to have any other amendments or any part of the Constitution. Because if you give the government all the power, including the power of the civilians to arm themselves, then the government can have unlimited power over you because you can't fight back. So a lot of people think that the Second Amendment is just there so that the pilgrims can hunt turkeys at Thanksgiving and, um, you know, people could go hunting for their food and defend themselves in their home. All good things. But the Second Amendment is really there as a check and balance, which is what our whole system is set up with, a check and balance against an overpowerful government that won't listen to the people anymore. And that just scare the bejeebies out of anybody that's thinking about you know, taking down our government. It certainly has dissuaded a lot of the enemies of our country to ever invade this country when they realize that for every man, woman, and child in our population, there's at least one weapon in circulation. And that should scare a whole lot of people into making sure that we have the ability to demand by force, if necessary, 
a change in our government if it ever gets too tyrannical. Um, but basically, our, our government is starting to fall apart for a couple big reasons. And if it was me deciding what were the key issues for the country today and what should be the key things that politicians should be um, campaigning on, um, they would be these three things. First of all, campaign spending reform. I don't think it's right that lobbyists and, and special interest groups should be able to go into a congressional member's office or the president's office or the governor's office and say, hey, um, you know, we'd really appreciate this kind of work and um, or this kind of uh, benefit or this kind of law. And oh, by the way, last year we contributed $100,000 or $10,000 to your campaign fund or we're contributing to this political action committee and they're gonna give you a big chunk of their money if you help us fight for this special interest or that special interest. And these special interests aren't just companies. A lot of people get, you know, bent that it's all big business. And it's not like the NRA only who fight for second amendment rights and people say they're just a big lobbying group for the gun manufacturers. Trust me, we don't sell a whole lot of guns in the United States compared to military weapons that are sold all over the world that are made by other companies besides the ones that support the NRA. But there's also the folks from non for profits from churches, from church groups, um, all kinds of folks lobby politicians. And it's gotten out of control. And we need to have campaign spending reform where, say, if you're going to run for president, the government's going to give you a million dollars to run your campaign. And if you're going to run for Senate, if U.S. Senate, they're going to give you, you know, $300,000 to run your campaign. And everybody's on a level playing field and it comes out of taxes. And we just cover it that way, but nobody can buy influence in, in our legislative or executive branch. The second thing I would do is term limits. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of young uh, politicians promise when they come to Washington to introduce a bill on term limits, and almost every year in the state legislature and in Congress, a bill on term limits does come up, and guess what? it never passes. It never gets anywhere. Because if you're counting on the legislative branch to limit their power, and there's that word again, power, um, they won't do it. They just, they, they can't do it. They, it's like they would, cons they would be considered um, cutting their own throat if they limited um, their terms. Uh, I would think what would be reasonable is 20 years in Congress. That would give you 10 terms as a, as a, House of Representative member, and maybe two or three terms as a senator, plus uh, one or one or two or three terms as a congressman. I mean, that's a 20-year career. And oh, by the way, some of those rules that the that the executive branch has set up in their departments, those are the same things that happen in Congress. The House and the Senate set up these rules so that they basically have seniority issues or or the 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 um, senior ranking person of the of the party that's got control of the House or the Senate can literally at this point in time stop legislation and blame the other party for not doing anything because they can because we've we've let Congress centralize power in one or two people and if you don't think that's true just look at what's going on today with Nancy Pelosi all by herself one woman can sit down and say hey. Uh, we want this law to go through and then coerce all the members from her party to vote for it or she'll blackball them. And the ones that don't want to vote for it probably will anyway because they're at risk of losing a bunch of their funding for their campaigns from the DNC. Or people will break from that party at, their, at risk and great peril uh, because they really don't like the bill. But they're doing it at great risk. And that's an unfair thing to put our legislators up against in their job, where they have to play politics every day with bills and legislation as it comes through. That's just wrong. So campaign spending reform, number one. Term limits, number two. And with the term limits, I'd also say refining the rules of the House and Senate so 
we can't centralize power in just one or two people out of a body of 500 people where we can just stop legislation or basically force the gov the president to use like President Obama said, I got a cell phone and a pen, I'll just write an executive order and make it happen. If the Congress doesn't want to take action, I'll just make it happen and let the courts figure out if it's legal or not. That that has a lot of weight. And you've seen President Obama do it a lot. And you're starting to see President Trump do it a lot. Because if Congress ain't going to move, then boom, he'll just do it. And you know what happens then? We've got 500 something people sitting in the state in the, in the US Capitol, getting paid a lot of money with big staffs getting paid a lot of money, and they're not doing squat. So if you're frustrated with government, start demanding that some of those things like term limits, campaign spending reform, and um, getting rid of lobbyists is the last one, um, and and reforming the lobbying, you know, rules, so that we can't have so much soft corruption filtering into our, our political process. So the second thing I think we've learned, besides the impact to our our country and our government from the the power, the the non traditional power shift, and that we picked up from coronaviruses that we've kind of let too much stuff get outside our personal control. Right now, government and technology basically control us. And this virus kind of gave us a picture of that as people started getting frustrated because they couldn't go back to work or they couldn't leave their houses and they were being told by the government they couldn't, even when a lot of times the quote unquote scientific data really didn't justify some of the draconian limitations they put on everybody. They felt frustrated and they began to realize that insidiously over decades and decades, we've given our government and technology the power to control us. And I, I mentioned last week in the show, imagine if the grid went down across the US for a week. The folks out in the country that live on the farm They'd be okay. They can slaughter a cow. They got chicken eggs. They got fruits, vegetables. They can trade with their neighbors. They'll get by. But if there's no grid power in, in a high rise in New York City or LA or at a big factory, all those people would be idled. No pay, no, no production, no nothing. People living in high rises, no electricity, meaning walking up 30, 40, 60 flights of stairs, or in, in New York City, maybe 100 flights of stairs. No water, because after a couple of days, the water supply on the roof is gone. They can't pump water up there, so there's no water in the building to flush a toilet, to drink, to do anything with. A city without a grid would be total chaos in a matter of hours, if not just a couple of days. It would, be, it would be total chaos. And same with technology. My wife's a teacher, or was a teacher, she's retired now, but some of her kids would go to like a summer Hawaiian studies program and when the kids would get out into these remote areas where there wasn't cell phone coverage, some of the kids literally started having psychological issues where they couldn't be separated from their Facebook or their Twitter or social contact or being able to contact their friends or their parents like instantly. And, and they would have to be sent home from these programs because they, they couldn't handle it. And it's like, really, have we gone that far? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. We've, in, again, insidiously, oh, after time, we've just watched these things kind of go slowly away from us and we've accepted it. And so now, if you take them away from us, you're literally, your, your life is at, at risk. And in reality, that's where we get back to Stan the Energy Man's primary mission, which is talking about clean, renewable, sustainable energy. You know, we need to use the energy that falls from the sky, blows with the wind, runs downhill with the stream of water through a hydroelectric um, turbine to get the electric energy we need. And we need to store extra energy in hydrogen or things that are non-carbon based storage mediums, not just batteries, but flywheels and hydrogen and things like that so that we can be self-sufficient and self-sustaining. We don't have to depend on other countries for fuel or for critical things like lithium or cobalt for our batteries. We don't have to depend on other countries for drugs. And we certainly, certainly, should it become a socialist, globally 
um, networked one big government thing and watch our broken government turn into a international broken system, which is what all the socialist stuff will drive us to. So a little bit of a different twist on energy and power, but I hope it gives you something to think about. And I hope you'll really think about elections this year and what's important this year and take some lessons learned from this COVID pandemic and really understand and think hard about what you've got, what you may have given up without knowing it and demanding a lot more out of our leaders and our government than we've been getting. So until next week, this is Stan the Energy Man signing off. Aloha.